Hi, thanks for tuning in for this presentation on radiator sizing. So, the importance. Condensing boilers work at higher efficiencies when they operate at lower temperatures. They'll be unlikely to condense working at the advertised radiator outputs. ASOS heat pumps have a higher coefficient of performance running at lower temperatures. Their cop is reduced if they're running too hot. Unbalanced temperature designs will result in rooms being too hot, too cold throughout the property. So the aim of this presentation is to explain heat loss, explain how it's calculated, explain design temperature, mean water to air temperature, explain delta T, examples, pros and cons of the correctly sized radiators, factors, summary. So heat loss, two types of heat loss for a property. We have fabric loss and we have ventilation loss. If we don't know the heat loss, we can't size a radiator or heat source correctly. So fabric loss is what's actually physically passing through all your walls and the fabric of the building, and windows, etc. Your ventilation loss are other things like uh, log burner, flue liners, uh, kitchen ventilation, bathroom ventilation, and then purpose-built ventilation into the actual building or brickwork itself. So on hotter days, your, uh, your property will actually be gaining heat from outside, and on colder days, you'll be losing heat to outside. So how heat loss is calculated? This is usually a chargeable survey and it's not a free quotation. So a heat loss survey is carried out of the property. All the walls, lengths, widths and heights are measured. All the floors and ceiling spaces are measured. Loft insulation thickness is recorded. All the doors and windows are measured. We note ventilation points. We note external walls. We note building fabric makeup. We note radiator size and type to determine if it's a correct size. Longhand heat loss surveys can take upwards of four hours to complete. This is on site, not talking to you. Uh, and this is for a normal size house. Okay, so we'll turn up, we'll measure everything, we'll make rough guides, and uh, we'll measure all your uh, radiators so we can go back and calculate if they're actually the right size or what needs doing with them. So after we've done our, our uh, on site survey, we'll go back to the office, we'll utilize things like SIBSI to get our U values, and we'll input um, some software could be an Excel sheet like we've got here. As you can see, we've got the actual fabric loss, we've got the ventilation loss, and it'll give us a total for the room. This one in particular is 1,051 watts, and one sheet will be done per room. Okay, this will all then go onto a totals page, so as you can see, this property has a heat loss of 5.937 watts, or roughly 6 kilowatts. Okay, uh, we used to add additional kilowattage for hot water, however, we tend to use priority domestic hot water these days, which means that you're only ever doing one at a time. It's either the water or the heating, so you can have a smaller boiler. Um, smaller boiler, dual temperature systems, and then weather compensation on the heating. So we heat this one up as quick as we can at a higher temperature, and then we revert back to a lower temperature heating system to match the heat loss for that given day. We have to heat the cylinder up to above 65. Well, so the cylinder gets heated to 60 with a flow temperature of around 65 to kill any bacteria and legionellas or something like that in there. So there is always a DOT, a design outside temperature. The below temperatures is up to 50 meters above sea level. So Scotland and, Ireland and the islands would be minus five. Midlands and Wales would be minus three. This is what we design it to. And then southern England, because it's down in the tropics, would be minus one. We design a DOT minus three due to our location with the internal temperature changing for rooms. So 21 for your lounge, bedrooms 18, you know, bathrooms and all the rest of it would be different. And, and this is dictated by the SIBSI, not so much the customer. OK, so as you can see on this heat loss survey here, only one wall is actually getting heat loss. So it's the outside external wall. So we've got an outside temperature there of minus three, room temperature 21, we've got a 24 degree difference. Times in that by the, uh, the square meterage and the U value and the delta difference is giving us 210 watts heat loss through the wall. Then we've got the window, that amounts up to everything with the floor and the ceiling and it gives us a total fabric loss for the building. We then add our ventilation loss, which gives us a total heat loss for the room. And there's one of these sheets done per room, as I said earlier. So it's quite a bit of measuring and work involved in that. OK, there is a certain amount of guesswork associated with heat loss surveys, as we don't fully know what the fabric makeup of the walls are internally. 
because we've just rocked up there and we're looking at a wall we don't know what's inside it so sometimes it's best guess uh, and with your assistance as well you might have drilled through them previously and this is especially uh, so in retrofit scenarios okay so a quick one engineer a person who performs precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge wizard or sorcerers so because of the guesswork you can actually contract another company in which is Veritherm. Uh, there's probably a few companies coming up like this, especially with all the air source heat pumps coming up. As you can see, there's a charge for this. Um, prices are from 500 plus VAT. What they'll do is they'll turn up at your property. They'll ask you to leave for 12 hours. They'll set up sensors in every room, a controlled heat source, and they'll monitor the live data heat loss from your property. So they're taking out all of the guesswork from finding out what's in the walls and everything. And they'll give you a live uh, insured calculation. So design temperature, mean water to air temperature. So design temperature, mean water to air temperature is what the design our system to operate at. It's likely that we'll only have one flow from our heat source, the boiler or the air source heat pump. Um, this will flow around all of our radiators and is a constant in the equation. The heat source will usually dictate its delta T between the flow and return. Uh, just for note, uh, radiators are sized to a BSEN number 442 and that is a standard. So in this example, we've got a room temperature of 21 and a mean water temperature of 71. Subtract our room temperature from our mean water temperature gives us 50. So this is the design temperature or mean water to air temperature of 50, DT 50. So if, uh, we've sized our room, we've gone to screw fix, we've looked at their website, we've noted the watt output for this radiator. We've got a 600 by 600 K2 double convector panel radiator. And boom, we're like saying 1056, that's, uh, that's on the money, we'll go for that radiator. And if you note in the specification there, it's a delta T of 50. So we've got the Stellrad website here. Again, it's a DT50, so you can see here they've stated the flow, the return, and the room temperature. So 10 degree difference, 20 degree room temperature there, and that's the output. And so it's about 10, 10 watts difference between the screw fix one for a like for like size K2. Our gas condensing boilers will most likely not even condense running at these design temperatures at minus three outside. The crazy thing is we've been, uh, it's been legislation to fit condensing boilers since the 1st of April 2000, 2005. Due to system design, we're not getting the benefits of these condensing appliances that we've all put in everywhere. So our return needs to be less than 55 degrees C to start dipping our toe into the condensing range on our boiler. So another mean water to air temperature, just to show you the difference, room temperature of 21 degrees, mean water temperature of 46 degrees, subtract our room temperature from our mean water temperature. So now we're on a DT 25 and then the same uh, room temperature is the same, mean water temperature 37.5, we subtract one from the other, gives us a design temperature of 16.5. So our, design, our desired room temperature has stayed at 21, but our system water temperature has reduced. If we keep the same size radiators, our output wattage would also reduce with the system water temperature. Our radiators will now need to increase in size to run at lower temperatures and increase our boiler efficiency. So I'll just move this. Like for like radiators here, we've got a 1200 by 600 K2. At DT50, we've got an output of 2134 watts, 2000 watts there, or just over. If we step it down to a DT25, we've now got 866 watts coming from that radiator. So as the temperature decreases, so is the output voyage. If we step it down then to a 16.5 ASOS heat pump sort of realms, we're only getting a quarter of the wattage we had at DT50. So if the system is designed at a mean water to air temperature of 50 to enable the radiator to heat up the room at minus three outside with a flow of 81 and a return of 61 and a mean water temp of 71, our condensing boilers will not even condense operating at those temperatures. It's critical that we know the heat loss and the mean water to air temperature when we're designing in order to size the radiators correctly and save the customer running costs and have a system that works slash balance throughout the property. If this isn't done, there may be further costs to correct the installation design errors in the future. This is as basic as you want to change a radiator. Well, if you put the radiator in that's on the same wrong design temperature, you're instantly going to have an imbalance in the property. So 
you, you should really be thinking about these things, otherwise your bedroom will be at 24 and your lounge at 18, for example. So, we know that changing the flow temperature or the mean water temperature in the radiators decreases the output. So now what we have to do is we have to increase the radiator size to get the same output to match the heat loss at minus 3 outside. So we know we need 1051 watts, so if we work at DT50 design temperature, we can get away with a 600 by 600 K2. If we now step down the mean water temperature and we work on a DT25, we now need a 600 by 1600 K2 to get the same output. And if we want to put in an air source heat pump and we want it to run at a 40 degree flow, we now need a 14, well actually we need, I'll move myself, we'll need two 1400 by 600 k2 radiators to heat the room at minus three outside to match the heat loss so big radiators and two of them so changing the mean water to air temperature design is done by using the conversion factors found in the sibsi flow return the delta the room temp etc is all taken into account and then we will get our correction factor which we can apply to our manufacturer's catalog stated data output which is as per the BSEN number, and then we convert to get set to the right output running at lower temperatures. So two ways of increasing radiator size, physically increase the radiator size, decrease the heat loss, which in turn increases the radiator size by improving insulation. So delta T, what does this mean? So the delta T is a difference between the flow and return on the heat source. So we got brand new gas condensing boiler there, it's going out at 75, coming back at 55, a 20 degree difference so it's a dt20 air source heat pump we're working at dt5 it's going out at 40 it's coming back at 35 so we've got four times the flow rate which is is a massive 300 percent increase in flow rate so this is why your pipe sizing has to change in the majority of situations when you're fitting an air source heat pump onto a system that previously had a gas condensing combi and then we've got our old standard efficiency boiler, which was pre-2005, which is going out at 81, coming back at 69, and is working on a DT11. Efficiencies then. So if we look at the efficiencies of these appliances, gas condensing boiler up to 96% efficient if it's on the right system. Air source heat pump up to 500% efficient if it's on the right system. And I say that with a big, if it's on the right system, you have to have the system designed correctly. And bear in mind, electric at the moment is uh, a lot higher than gas. That's why you need those efficiency gains. Uh, as it comes down, great, we're on for a winner, aren't we? And then old standard efficiency, 85% um, efficiency on that gas boiler. So by changing to condensing boilers overnight, we had an 11% increase in efficiency on these appliances, but only if it was condensing. Okay, so there's an example here. We've got a DT50, so you've got a flow of 81, a return of 61. It's on a, it's on a condensing boiler there, DT20, it's mean water temperature of 71 degrees. So we move on to the next one, and this is, this is a big one because we're at 56 degrees here. So we're nearly at the Part L building regulations update for June 2022. All new systems are gonna have to be designed to work at 55 or less. So you can see that's a huge change in radiator sizes going forward. So mean water temperature of 46 there, take away our room temp, uh, we're down to uh, a DT25. So you can see now we're on an ASOS heat pump, same mean water temperature there, but we're on DT5 now. So we've got four times the flow rate. Uh, we're going in at 48.5 and we're coming out at 43.5. So pipe work needs to be updated. The radiator itself will need to be updated for the output but it doesn't know that it's four times the flow rate through the radiator, all right? But it's the same mean water to air temperature. And then we've now gone down into as best as we can get it for our air source heat pump. We've got a flow of 40, return of 35. We've got DT5, so we're on, we're on a design temperature of 16.5. So we're hoping we'd have a really good cop with that system. So pros and cons, okay? Um, there's higher efficiency on condensing boilers and renewables, so they're cheaper to run when we operate them at lower temperatures. Reduce stress on the heating system due to operating at lower temperatures, thermal stresses, etc. Reduce corrosion rates within the system. Comfort increased with stable room temperatures depending on controls. And it's greener for the environment, which is what everyone's aiming for, really. 
So cons of lower temperature system, it's higher installation costs, two man lifts just to get these radiators on the walls. The higher plant costs initially, you know, larger radiators cost more than small radiators and you need a good wall to hang them on. Larger radiators within the property taking up wall space. Again, it's not just having a good wall to hang them on and you're happy with having great big radiators on the wall. <laughs> They're gonna take up a lot of your wall space as well. And then there's another potential of bacteria growth within the system. If water management is not controlled and biocides and things like that are not added, or maybe um, VDI 2035, the German version of water treatment, which is uh, continuity, uh, sorry, conductivity is reduced and uh, keeping the pH levels the same. So here's an example of sizing the radiators for the heat loss of the room. So actually, we're getting the right room temperatures at minus three outside. And it, it is for exercise only because we put the bedrooms at 21 and everything else. And that was me just being lazy with the XL really. But you can see pretty much with Bob on the money there, just with catalog radiator sizes being right for the heat loss of the room. Everything is, is you know, from 20 to 22 there in that bedroom, we'd have to do something with balancing on that. But we're pretty much Bob on. Um, the next example is what we've done is we've gone around, we've measured what the space is available and the window sizes, and we've just took a bit of a guess. And then we've actually calculated afterwards. This is just for exercise, just to prove the point. So we can see now we picked the radiator that was 1200 by 600 for the lounge, because that's the size of the wall space available underneath the window. But at minus three outside at those flow temperatures, which are all below at a DT35, we're now gonna get our lounge. If we had no thermostat, no control or anything, it's gonna be at 26.8. Our kitchen, on the other hand, because it's undersized, is now going to be 13.7 degrees. Our, la our hallway, 19.4. And, and you can see, as we go along, uh, we're going to be fighting here with TRVs, thermostats, and everything else. And, and we're going to have to have a thermostat in the room that's set to one temperature just to offset the actual temperature given off by the radiator. So they, this would be a real poorly designed system. And uh, we often get this with customers asking, saying, oh, my bedroom is always hot or cold, or, or why is it so cold in this room? It's, it's just poor system design. No one's ever calculated it, and it's, they're running on different um, DTs or not worked out. All right, so uh, we've had this recently. A new annex uh, has been put on an older building. They had big radiators in the main house. They had small radiators in the second house. Um, I think the carpenter had uh, calculated them up. So you're always gonna get problems inherent just by design alone on this one. So if the house is at the correct temperature, the annex is gonna be cold. If the annex is at the correct temperature, say you move the thermostat, then the house is gonna be really, really hot. Controls, you know, controls might also get in the way with this. Um, so if you've set the thermostat to 20 in the house and it's hit demand, the heating is gonna switch off and then the actual, uh, the annex would be cold. You might have zone valves or whatever else, but it's still gonna be, if the radiator is never the right size, it's not gonna get the temperature, especially if you're using things like weather compensation. So if the curve is set for the house, the annex is gonna be cold. If the curve is set for the annex, then the house is gonna be hot because you've got one flow temperature. And if you, if you say it's cold in the annex and you've got the thermostat on, the actual weather compensation is gonna take over the flow temperature. So you're never gonna get the temperature. It's just gonna cool all the time. Okay, factors that you might not think about. If we pipe our radiators like this, which is top and bottom both on the same side, we're gonna get the catalog output of what we saw in Screwfix or the Stellarad um, catalog there. If we start piping it like the European and German way, we actually get an additional 5% output. So we can either keep the same size radiator and run at a lower temperature again, more efficient, or we can downsize the radiator slightly. If we pipe the old British way, uh, whereas uh, opposite sides piped on the bottom, we're going to subtract 4% from our advertised radiator outputs because that's the way we pipe them. So in certain enclosures, um, so you, say you buy a new house and you don't like the ghastly radiator on the wall, so you, you buy this uh, radiator cover online, in certain enclosures you could lose up to 30% on the output of that radiator. So all, all the heat calc and everything else, you've already caused like a 30% reduction. Imagine that in Formula One. Um, this is all according to uh, the domestic heating design guide. 
So in summary, you have to know the heat loss to size the radiator correctly. The lower the flow temperature, the higher the efficiency in most cases. The lower the flow temperature, the less output you'll get from the radiator. Try to stick to the same mean water to air temperature design throughout the building to minimize imbalance in room temperature in conjunction with the correct heat loss calculation and survey. You may be better paying someone to consult on this process. A look ahead for part L for the building regulations update in June 2022. So you can see there, this is a draft wording from that regulation, this update that comes in force. The flow temperature of 55 degrees C or lower. So this is absolutely a huge change in how we now design our systems where we've got these advertised DT50. We're now stepping down to DT24. So gas boiler flow, 55 degrees. So return, 35 degrees, 20 degree difference across the actual radiators themselves. Mean water temperature of 45, subtract your room temperature of 21. You're gonna have a DT, a design temperature of 24, which is gonna be absolutely big radiators. And depending on how they, they sort of police this, manufacturers could just stay on heating. Your max flow is now 55 degrees because that's building regs. So you, you, you're not going to get your room to temperature unless you upsize your radiators on these new installations. So uh, if you have used DT50 design, uh, you could have heated your room with a 1000 by 600 K2, giving you uh, 1700 watts there or thereabouts. Uh, for a like for like heat loss in the room, you'd now need two times 1400 by 600 K2s to achieve the same output. So is it the carrot? Is it the stick? Um, we do need to get a grip of it. You can see there our heating output from the energy saving trust there on our uh, CO2 kilograms is huge for domestic heating. Uh, and, and they want to get to net zero by 2050. Um, so maybe they'll make manufacturers start stepping the boilers down at 55 degrees and that'll be max flow temperatures for heating. All right, so a bit of food for thought there. Thanks for listening and uh, hopefully uh, tune in soon for more content. Bye for now.